and go. Okay, I think we're getting ready to start here. Good evening and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. My name is Kai Bird and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I wanna thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will be on Tuesday, May 2nd at 6.30 p.m. when Daryl Pinckney will be in conversation with our own Thad Zolkowski. They will be talking about Pinckney's memoir, Come Back in September. This will be a hybrid event taking place at CUNY's Graduate Center in the Skylight Room, but it will also, you'll also be able to see it online. And then on May 9th, there will be a Zoom only event in which Peter Stansky will discuss his biography of George Orwell with Joseph Cannon. Finally, I want to encourage any working biographers or aspiring biographers to register online with BIO, Biographers International Organization, for our jointly sponsored annual conference on biography. This will take place at the Graduate Center on May 19th and 20th, mainly on the 20th, that Saturday. Please mark your calendars and register for all of these events on the Leon Levy website. And please encourage your friends and relatives to subscribe to our digital mailing list. But tonight we are gathered to celebrate the publication of Professor Carolyn Rusty Eisenberg's new book, Fire and Rain. Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia. She will be in conversation with Professor Tim Naftali. Carolyn Woods Eisenberg is a professor of US history and American foreign relations at Hofstra University. She is the author of Drawing the Line, The American Decision to Divide Germany, 1944 to 49, a, a book that be, was a winner of the Stuart Burnath Book Prize of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations and the Herbert Hoover Book Prize and a finalist for the Lionel Gelber Book Prize. Tim Naftali is the director of New York University's undergraduate public policy program, and since 2016, a CNN presidential historian. Naftali was appointed the first federal director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in the year 2006. He oversaw the release of over a million pages of documents, over 350 hours of Nixon tapes, established the first video oral history program for a pre presidential library and authored the library's Watergate Gallery. Naftali, who wrote a biography of George H.W. Bush, is currently at work on a presidential biography of John F. Kennedy. His byline appears regularly in the Atlantic and Foreign Affairs. Please look for all these books at bookshops.org, a, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Eisenberg and Naftali will now be in conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box, the Q&A box, uh, not the chat box below to type in your questions, and Tim will be sure to get to as many as he can. We will try to end this program after one hour, around eight o'clock. Again, thanks to Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. And now I turn this conversation over to Tim Naftali. Thank you, Tim. Oh, it's my pleasure, Kai. Welcome to all of you and welcome, Rusty. Um, we are uh, honored and pleased to have uh, this absolutely superb historian of the Cold War um, who contributed so much to our understanding of the division of Germany at the beginning of the Cold War, and has now um, provided us with an engaging study of a very difficult moment in American and world history, um, the American War uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, I'd like to begin, um, Rusty, by asking you what questions you had uh, as you entered 
this study. After all, this is not the first book on the Vietnam War, <laughs> and it won't be the last book on the Vietnam War. But what were the questions that drove you to engage this subject after you'd worked so long and so hard on the question of Germany? Well, uh, first of all, um, I just want to thank the um, Thai uh, for the invitation and for this excellent series that so many of us have benefited from. And, um, and my appreciation to Tim as well for being the questioner. Um, so why did I start something as crazy as this, right? I think that's the, the point. And actually, this is like my student's fault. I sort of, I went into the sideways. I hadn't planned to write any books at all. Um, and I was teaching my Vietnam course and I had assigned a chapter uh, by Marilyn Young on the Nixon administration and its conduct of the war in Vietnam. And my class objected to her analysis and they were very insistent that she hadn't explained it because, and frankly, they were confused because here is Nixon, the consummate politician, right? So why in the world would he have mortgaged his administration um, to this Vietnam War? Why didn't he smell the coffee and get out? So that was the beginning. And then I told Marilyn that my students didn't think she explained the war very well. Um, so because of that complaint, I ended up having to write an article for her uh, on the subject and realized that I didn't understand it either. So I think it started in that way. It's literally, I just wanted to understand why he stayed in the war as long as he did. However, the project changed in very major ways, which I would really um, emphasize. That pretty early on, one of the things that I began to realize as I was looking into this was that it really was a mistake to just look at the wars in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, that it really had to be seen in relation to Nixon's policies towards China and towards the Soviet Union, that that had to really, you know, be brought into the picture in, in, in a major way. So that was one realization. The other thing that really was motivating me, and this really came out of my teaching, you know, it's not just that the students kept saying, how do you explain it? It doesn't make sense. But one of the things that I began to appreciate from teaching foreign policy and teaching the you know, Vietnam War, really almost any period, is that for my students, studying policy in and of itself and you know, what policymakers say to each other is really boring and doesn't seem meaningful to them. And I began to really feel like part of the problem um, is that when you write a lot about policy in a detailed fashion and you don't talk about what this policy means to actual people, that it loses all of its significance and also impairs your ability to understand the policymakers. I mean, I think that's part of my realization that, that to understand that question that my students were asking you know, 25 years ago, that part of the understanding requires that you actually look at what this policy really meant. And lastly, I'll just say this very briefly, I think the other thing that really came into focus for me once I started to be serious was also the need to put Nixon and Kissinger in a larger context that even though their personalities are very distinctive and you, know, you could really get absorbed in them for endless amounts of time, they weren't just operating on, on their own, that they were operating within an institutional network, within, within a public network. And so I felt like almost none of the literature had adequately dealt with that, of trying to put them in context. So all of those things were in my mind once I started. Um. And uh, I, for, for, for those of us, for those watching and, uh, and I hope future readers of this book, um, they will notice that you spend a lot of time um, explaining the anti-war movement and what's going on outside of the White House. And, and I can see where that comes from because in a sense, you're showing the effect of Nixon and Kissinger's decisions, uh, not simply on the Vietnamese or the Laotians, or the Cambodians, but also on, on the American people. And so that it gives a certain a real depth to the story that is missing in uh, straight policy histories. What were the surprises for you 
as you were doing this, as you delved into the new material, because you're doing this at a time when the database about the Vietnam War is growing exponentially. Right. What were the surprises? I know I used to think I would be writing this book till I was 100. Um, but I, I would say you know, there were quite a number of surprises. You know, from the time, I mean, I was part of the anti-war movement. So as were, you know, large numbers of people of my age, this is nothing amazing um, about that. Uh, so I had a natural interest in it. But one of the things about the anti-war movement as it was unfolding, I think, was that it was never very clear if you were being effective. You know, you had these huge marches. Did they matter? Did they, you know, how did they affect policy? And there was almost a kind of negativity about it, you know, just thinking, well, you know, all, none of these things are working. So although it wasn't really the case, I didn't set out to say how effective was the anti-war movement. That actually wasn't one of my questions. However, once I started to look at the material, I realized that the anti-war movement was far more effective than we had appreciated at the time. And one of the pieces of that, uh, which at the time, I don't think the people I knew certainly didn't appreciate, is that because of the anti-war movement, Richard Nixon had to take troops out. And he started to do that in the summer of 1969, and he kept taking troops out in increments. And if you were like in the middle of the anti-war movement and you were, you know, seeing period these announcements, 50,000 are coming out, 40,000 are coming out, you know, the tendency was, oh, well, it's all a trick and look how many places he's bombing. And, you know, it's just all the American public is being tricked. And what I realized once I started to look at the record was actually that was what the anti-war movement was doing, was that it was creating a context in which he had to start removing the troops. Now there's a very good film that just came out, documentary, the the Madman and and the movement, which is focused at a very particular moment um, in '69 where uh, the moratorium occurs. Nixon is planning an escalation at that point. He actually the moratorium does make it impossible, um, you know, for him to do the particular escalation that they were thinking about. So that's one very acute moment where you see it. But more over the space of four years is that you realize that by the time he's at election day, the U.S. has no more combat troops in Vietnam. And I'm thinking to myself, how come we didn't notice that back then? That's pretty, that was pretty meaningful. So that's one surprise. And without going on too long, I am going on too long. But, you know, the other related surprise, and, and Tim, you may have some thoughts about this as well, was Melvin Laird, the Secretary oh, yes. of Defense. Oh, yes. Right. I mean, Melvin Laird back in the day was just seemed to that, you know, to the outside world, just another one of those people in the Nixon administration who wanted to wage war. But one of the things that you start as soon as you start looking at that declassified record, what you see is that Melvin Laird was pushing mm -hmm. constantly for those troops to come home. It was really his biggest commitment. I, I interviewed him twice on the phone. And I wanted to do it in person. And I think the first conversation we ever had, he's, he's immediately said, do you know how many kids I got out of that goddamn place? You know, which was really interesting that that was, you know, what was staying with him. But Melvin Laird and the role he played can't be separated from the anti-war movement. It really can't be. And you want to remember as well that Melvin Laird was coming from the Congress. He wasn't a national security bureaucrat. And even though the Republicans in Congress were often very docile and infuriating, there was a lot of anti-war sentiment among them. And Laird was part of that. And an awareness about the levels of discontent of young people in this country, including Laird's kid, right? So, so all of that, I don't think I appreciated Laird. I didn't appreciate that the troops were coming home. So I would say those are some pretty big surprises. The book is really uh, especially strong in explaining Laird's approach and the games he played, because I think you show very effectively that Henry Kissinger got outfoxed he by did. Mel Laird. Yes. Um, and and that's a that's a that's a very important story because it 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 shows you it shows 
the you know we we in history we we talk about top down and bottom up, and you show how you need both. So you have you have the movement, but you also needed somebody up who was very sensitive with very very sharp antennae, and that's Mel Laird, who is responding to to the movement um, in the White House or around. He's at the Pentagon, but he's certainly meeting at the White House. You also give a voice to someone else too, since we're it, we're we're being hosted by a wonderful uh, center for the study of biography. You talk a lot about Haig. Yes. Now, so General Haig, what role does General Haig play in this story? Well, for one thing, he's huge. Um, second thing is he hates Laird. Um, <laughs> and what I mean, Haig is one of these figures that at first seems like. You know, he's not really very important. He doesn't hold an important title at all. Um, but he quickly becomes more and more important, particularly one of the things that he enables uh, Kissinger and Nixon to do is he becomes a liaison to the military in Vietnam. Because one of the problems that Nixon and Kissinger faced is if you just went up through the normal bureaucratic channels, the military would then in Vietnam would then be communicating to the Secretary of Defense, right? And you know, information would be flowing through Laird and back through Laird. And by the time I would say by maybe by September of 1969, Kissinger already knows that Mel Laird is an is an adversary, and Nixon understands that as well, and that they need to have a way of being in touch with the career military that goes around Laird. So, and I, and I would put in there as well, not just the military in um, in, in Vietnam um, and General Abrams, but also the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Same thing, that they want to have a pipeline to the Joint Chiefs of Staffs, which Mel Laird would know nothing about. Now, I have to say, when I interviewed Mel Laird, one of the things that he told me was, he said, you know, they're always trying to trick me. And they always think that they're pulling the wool over my eyes. And they didn't really get that I had sources of information that they couldn't even imagine. So Laird initially becomes important that way. He also becomes important because, as, as you know, um, and it's been widely discussed, Many of the civilians on Henry Kissinger's staff um, become somewhat disaffected from Kissinger and are beginning to look like they're doves. And ultimately, as you know, some number of them quit, you know, during the Vietnam invasion, of the, during the Cambodian invasion. Um, so here's Haig on Kissinger's staff. And maybe at the beginning, Kissinger thinks he's not the smartest guy in the world, but by the time that they're into year two of this, um, that Haig becomes the person that Kissinger relies on. The problem is that over time, Haig becomes so crucial to everybody that he actually becomes a rival to Kissinger, which is sort of an irony of that. And you know, one of the things, I still don't know that I really did this very well in the book, uh, you know, so maybe I'll write another one. But, you know, one of the things is that, um, you know, initially, a lot of the things that Kissinger and Nixon are doing are fundamentally, you know, reflective, not just of them, but of the career military. So what they, they're listening to what the Joint Chiefs are saying, they're listening to what General Abrams is saying. So that they're not just like two people alone. This is that's a very important reference group for them, including the CIA, which they're, you know, up and down about. So, you know, they're not this isolation of them, which often is what happens in the literature, isn't always true. However, I think by the end of that first term, what ha what's happening is the three of them are increasingly isolated from everybody else in the administration, that that's a really interesting trajectory. And there they are with each other, you know, as Nixon's first term is coming to an end and these crucial negotiations are taking place with Hanoi. And it's a very, um, in some ways, it's a very pathological situation because they, that as they're making decisions that affect the lives of, you know, thousands of people, they're in their interactions with each other, which have gotten more and more convoluted. 
Um, and I think, you know, you could argue that one of the expressions of that convoluted situation and that there are twist, twisted connections to one, to each other is really the Christmas bombing of Hanoi, Definitely. which was really absolutely unnecessary. Um, no, they, they claimed they were doing it because North Vietnam had left the peace talks. That wasn't true. What was true was that Le Duc Tho had said that he would, there was tension with the Politburo back in Hanoi, that he needed to go back for consultation, but he was sure they were going to have an agreement and he was leaving his experts um, in Paris to keep working on it. And actually only like in the last month when I was talking with John Negroponte, who apparently was one of those experts that was left in Paris, they were working on an agreement. Um, things once the U.S. starts bombing Hanoi, then those negotiations um, do stop. Um, but that's it, it's twisting of cause and effect. But what I'm saying is there was never any good reason to bomb Hanoi or to kill the people that were in Hanoi. I mean, it was very fortunate that the North Vietnamese um, had gotten most of the children out of the city. Um, Although, you know, they, those children came back, I, you know, and, and many of those children came back to a horrific scene. Uh, I think some of the, our viewers may not uh, recall, uh, just to put this into some perspective, that um, this was just after the 1972 election and just before the election, Henry Kissinger made a statement to the effect that peace was at hand, that, that a, a negotiated settlement with the North Vietnamese was, was, was close. Um, and, and so you have this situation, uh, but then the problem arises once again of South Vietnam right. and the fact that the South Vietnamese government is not interested in the terms of the likely agreement with Hanoi. And that's the beginning of a tragic series of events, which right. leads to the unnecessary bombing at Christmas time. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, in fact, Kissinger had achieved a peace agreement with Hanoi. Um, and so, again, you know, one of the interesting things being a historian and going back at events that you lived through is that you can find out all the ways you were wrong <laughs> at the time. So I remember when he said peace is at hand, I you know that's not true. He's just making that up. No, it was, you know, and then the, but but the South Vietnamese were so upset with the agreement that had been made um, because there were gonna be 140,000, 150,000 North Vietnamese troops left in the South. I mean, that was, you know, that was a genuine problem for, the, uh, for Saigon. So Nixon did not wanna have a blow up with South Vietnam before the election. Therefore Kissinger had, was stalled. But so, then Kissinger goes back and tries to change the terms that he had just promised the North Vietnamese he wasn't going to change. And so then the negotiations become more complicated. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, and Kissinger is very frustrated and he's very mad um, that this has happened. But again, it's all in a context where North Vietnamese have made it very clear they want an agreement. They're ready to sign. And despite the fact that the, the Kissinger knows this, Nixon knows it, they ordered the bombing of Hanoi. You do point out though, that Nixon is the most reluctant of the three regarding the bombing. He actually doesn't want right. to do the bombing. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things, you know, and this a little bit goes back to the peace movement and its impact, which I would say overall, one of the points in, the, in my book is really that the peace movement has a continuing influence on policy. And I think, um, I don't know if you, you would agree with this, but I actually think that when you take both the four years and think about them all you know, together, that one of the effects of the peace movement is that Nixon gets sick of the war. He really hates the war. I know, you know, back then we said, oh, you know, he wants to make wage war forever. No, he doesn't. He's sick of the war. And partly it's because, and this, you know, I, I think Donald Trump has made me like Nixon a little bit better. Nixon really wanted to be a great president. I mean, I, you know, I think that that's actually true. I mean, you know, 
he did terrible things. He's responsible for the death of literally millions of people, of the destruction of Cambodia. We're not, we're not talking about little things that, that happen. We're talking about horrible human tragedies. But in his mind, he wants to be a great president. He wants to be seen that way. He wants to have major accomplishments. And the fact that year in and year out that he's stuck in this war, that there are all these protesters, you know, and for a while he has some energy for like combating the protesters. I mean, that's, you know, initially. But, you know, four years later, he's really sick of it. He wants to go on to other things. So, I mean, that's a very ironic you know, result. And, you know, that also ties into this other issue of the Chinese and the Russians, I mean, which I think is a really important story itself for many, many reasons. But one of the things is that when Nixon makes these trips to Russia and then to China, and we do, we were talking earlier, right? Those records are there now. You can, people can read how those, how those negotiations went. Nixon loves being in Moscow. He loves being in China. He feels like he's making history. And, you know, he's very carried away by it. And he gets tremendous praise back home, you know, for his diplomacy there. And, and I do think, you know, again, I wouldn't have appreciated this without Donald Trump. It makes you appreciate a lot of things. But one of them is, you know, Nixon knew how to act like a president. You know, whatever, he's quietly getting drunk and he's cursing and so forth and so on. But you know what? He knows how to be the president of the United States. He understands the dignity of that office. He's observed Dwight Eisenhower, who he greatly admires. And so when he goes to these cap foreign capitals, his conduct there is very impressive. You know, if you were in the peace movement, you weren't impressed. But for much of the country, it is impressive, and he has this sense of, of really moving history. Um, and so he likes that better. Um, and he really wants to be onto something else. And he, of course, in the end, can't get free of it. Do you think he moved history? Do you think that these trips resulted in the leverage that he was looking for to get North Vietnam to listen to Beijing and Moscow? Not very much. I mean, part of it, we should probably clarify for folks that are listening, um, that he and Kissinger both had this idea, first, that they thought that the Russians, right, could be tempted to play, you know, that you would tell the Russians that we were, all these wonderful concessions would just be coming if they would just get Hanoi you know, to be more cooperative at the peace table. So that becomes their idea. And then when the opening to China happens in 71, they think that could even work even better because they'll play on the rivalry of the two powers. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that Kissinger, you know, loves to do is describe these machinations, even when they don't come to much. So I, I think in the end, you know, they are somewhat successful in getting mainly the Russians to put some pressure on the North Vietnamese. But as de Brinen keeps telling Kissinger over and over again, the North Vietnamese don't listen to us. <laughs> that's what he said. And, it, and that's basically true. I mean, North Vietnam might have listened if, for example, the Russians were threatening to withhold, um, you know, their, all the weapons they were sending or the economic aid. If they had done those things, then that might have made an impact. But they didn't do those things. And you know, even at the point that that Kissinger is congratulating himself endlessly on how brilliantly he's handled things, he doesn't even notice that the level of aid from China is going up. It's not going down. So I don't think that you know that ploy. I don't think worked. But I think what did work is that first of all, there was a relationship to China that was opened and that that, you know, was very positive for the world. Um, you know, among other things, the way that that relationship got opened though was that uh, Kissinger covertly made it clear to the Chinese that the US wasn't all that interested in Taiwan, right? Really was ready to let Taiwan go, which is very ironic, you know, given what's happening now. But, you know, Kissinger and Nixon would say, well, you know, we can't tell the country how we really feel about Taiwan, but we will. You know, and Joanne Lai says, that's not a great way to conduct business, right? Yeah. Because it could lead to some bad problems later on. 
Oh, they, those those uh, memcoms between Bon Lai and Harry Kissinger are amazing. The secrets that Kissinger tells the Chinese, uh, a, a regime that that was uh, a, an enemy of the United States only a year earlier. It, it's remarkable. Um, but, Kissinger seems very much at ease with Zhou Enlai, at least in the context of the memcoms. They love Zhou Enlai. I mean, and and after they signed the peace agreement in 73, right, Kissinger goes back and he meets Mao again, you know, which he considers like incredibly wonderful. In fact, he thinks that Mao is so amazing. He wants to tell Nixon that Mao isn't even fat, that that's a mistake. <laughs> I mean, it's like, how ridiculous could you be? But, you know, in, what's really unfunny about this is that I think there's no question that in dealing with the Russians and the Chinese that any sense of them as even serious enemies kind of goes away. And that would be maybe a good thing if you weren't killing people every single day, right? If you weren't destroying Cambodia, if you weren't decimating villages in Laos, you know, if those things weren't happening, you say, okay, whatever, you know, isn't it good that they're getting along better with the Russians and the Chinese? Um, but that, I mean, to me, and you know, it's funny that I worked on this for 20 years and I'm still shocked, which is really amazing. You know, but when I think of what they're doing to those three countries in the name of fighting communism and what the reality is and the negotiations with the Russians and the Chinese, you know, that that contradiction is so profound and so infuriating. Um, true. And but did you notice that the Chinese and the Russians also weren't that interested in the number of people who were dying in Southeast Asia? They weren't. I no. mean, I, th I think that that's true. I mean, um, because that, after all, in, in the sad story of Cambodia, you'd have the North Vietnam, the Vietnamese fighting the Chinese over right. Cambodia. Yeah. So they 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 had all kinds of ambitions uh, in that area. The, the Chinese, uh, yeah, Ch Chinese and the Vietnamese. Right. Although the difference between the, I mean, it, it is interesting. There are, if you look at the transcripts, and you probably have looked at a lot of them. Um, there are actually moments where Brezhnev, who well, you know, some of you think he's the most boring person imaginable, <laughs> but. Brezhnev actually, at, at certain points, becomes quite eloquent in his remarks, particularly to Kissinger, about the human cost in Southeast Asia. He really is. And, and you know, on numbers of occasions, both he and de Berenin, you know, say, you know, you people have made this horrible mess and you're coming to us to get you out of it. Why is it our responsibility to get you out of it when you just keep digging in and, and the casualties have gone up and up? I mean, ultimately they they, they stopped going up and up, but um, I, I actually think you know that that's not a small thing. I mean, the Russians aren't responsible. They may do other things in other arenas, but they're not responsible you know, for what's happening in Vietnam. And, you know, I, this one smaller point, which I, I just don't, I don't want to get lost in this, again, about the absolute indifference to the human price that's being paid. I mean, it's, that's sometimes, after 20 years, I'm still shocked by that. But, you know, with the Christmas bombing, one of the things that um, is interesting and important is that, you know, the Vietnamese had perfected their, their, um, their ability to shoot American planes out of the sky. Interestingly, when, when I was in Vietnam and I interviewed a Vietnamese general who was involved in that, he said that they had done a terrible job in the spring of 72 in, in shooting down American bombers, but that they had worked like crazy so that by December, they were gonna be in a position to do that. And Laird knew it. So when they ordered the Christmas bombing, one of the things that Laird says directly is you understand that when you do that bombing, you know, for every hundred planes that you send up, there's gonna be, you know, some X amount of American planes that are gonna be shot down. We're gonna have pilots killed while we do this. 
And I mean, and that's really where one of the times where, where Laird really does show his, you know, kind of moral concern about what they're doing. But this is a matter of utter indifference also. You know, it's not yeah. just that they're indifferent to the people who live in Hanoi, they're indifferent to, to our own pilot. And, and what's so, uh, it's clear in your book, and I, I had learned that at the library, what is so, uh, so distressing is that the Christmas bombing was designed to change one mind. And that was the mind of Tew, the South, I think, the right. president of South Vietnam. Nothing to do with, the, with Hanoi because Hanoi had already made all the concessions. It was Tew. It was somehow in a strange way to, um, to show the South Vietnamese that the United States still cared. It, it weird, uh, but maybe, did you sense that? Yeah, so the, I guess I also would add to that um, with regard to the North Vietnamese, I think we, you and I probably agree that this was not really relevant to changing their negotiating posture. But when you read the record, especially for those last, say, 18 months of that, of that first term, they, the two of them are very drawn to the idea that when they leave, they're going to make a mess, that they're going to, you know, that just that they could go out in a ferocious way. You know that 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 has a that has a constant draw to them. You mean to um, Kissinger and Nixon, right? You know um, that that no matter what, you know that what, you're not going to just leave nicely. Um, now Kissinger fluctuates on that point because he's also very drawn to the idea that he's picturing himself going to Hanoi and you know he's going to have saved the day with his diplomacy. But but when you re read that record, you, you do get that theme over and over. Well, we're going to go out, but when we go out, we're going to, you know, sure as hell make sure they know we were there. You know, there's a yeah. lot of that um, bravado. Alpha so male, think, yes, alpha male nonsense. I mean, really, <laughs> you know, power, so, so when they're kind of with the Christmas bombing in particular, you know, some of that, you know, atavistic kind of emotion, like, let's just make a big mess. Um, and, you know, I think, by the way, that's one of the things that is shocking about the tapes. And you probably know this better than I do, is, you know, Americans were shocked by the tapes that came out in 1974, I guess, you know, with the Watergate discussions. But when you see, and, and many Americans think that that was it, that the tapes came out, you know, a zillion years ago, and that was it. But they didn't, you know that. Uh, or, you know, the tapes about everything else hadn't come out. And, you know, you you listen to the, it's so, uh, so much of it is primitive what in their conversation about when they're talking about, you know, the war and when they're talking about American bombing. And I'm not just speaking now about the, about the Christmas bombing, but it's even more sharp when you look at the period in, in the spring of 72, after there's been a North Vietnamese offensive. And the two of them are like conversing about, you know, how they're gonna punish, you know, the 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 North Vietnamese, and, you know, the, the, how much damage they're gonna be able to do. And Nixon decides to risk the summit with the Russians, right? Right, he the, does, the, although he, he gets, he thinks that John Connolly is a genius. You know, Nixon has <laughs> these sort of special people. <laughs> and um, John Connolly, formerly uh, you know Secretary of the Treasury, so you know Connolly had actually helped him think that he actually was going to get, you know, that he actually was going to get away with this. Is that he could bomb Hanoi, and that the Russians would nevertheless allow the summit to go forward, right? And then that's, and 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 that's in fact what happened. Yeah. But there's a point, you know, just to back up for one minute, um, you know, on this issue of the ferocity and the desire to do damage, you know, for, for folks listening may not all remember exactly that in the spring of 72, there was a big North Vietnamese offensive. Um, and that after all these years, there came the North Vietnamese army over the DMZ, coming out of Laos, coming out of Cambodia, it makes them look ridiculous. Like, what were they doing? You know, this could even happen, right? And they're furious. But incredibly, one of the things which I discovered, and I don't know, uh, Tim, if you saw this when you were dealing with the records, but um, 
at the point that you've got that North Vietnamese offensive going on in South Vietnam, what is occurring is that there's a fight that they have with General Abrams, who's American commander in Vietnam, because General Abrams wants American bombing to be focused on the South in order to make sure that the South Vietnamese army is not going to get vanquished. Nixon and Kissinger wanted the bombing in the North, even though it won't help, um, you know, win anything. But Nixon says, I don't have the quote in front of me, and, you know, Nixon says, I'm not going to give up the chance to really destroy North Vietnam by wasting bombing in the South. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, and I, I, so that's another one of these places where you just see that there's there's also anger here and and just that the idea that you could you're mad at Hanoi and now you have all these bombers and you could just, you know, have so much destruction there. It's it's horrifying. I'm, we're going to turn to questions in a moment, but before we do, I want to get back to this, the question your student asked you 20 some years ago. Um, you have this situation where a a um, a secretary of, the, of defense, Mel Laird, is forcing the president of the United States to uh, pull out troops at a time when his national security advisor wants maximum pressure on Hanoi to get them to negotiate. So mm -hmm. these are contradictory pressures. Right. To get back to your student's question, I don't want to think of that student. He's ruined my life. But, no, you no, know, this no, he's he's enriched our world because the book exists. But why does Nixon a allow these contradictory pressures to continue, and and b why doesn't he just get out of the war? What's well, the answer to your question? I don't your, your have a question? single answer. My book is five hundred pages for that exact reason. You know, so what is the answer? There is no single answer, but there's some. And, you know, and one part of the answer, which we haven't really talked about, is that when he comes into office, he, first of all, he is really guided by the military. Um, and the military opinion at the point at which Nixon becomes president is that because of Tet, that, this, that the communists have sustained an enormous defeat. You know, and they're not totally crazy, right? I mean, in terms from what we know, you know, retrospectively, that as far as the National Liberation Front is concerned, that they actually did sustain a great deal of damage. And the North Vietnamese Army did as well. So the atmosphere, you know, in terms of the Joint Chiefs and also back at, you know, military headquarters in Saigon, is that they've actually had a success, regardless of what the American public thinks. And that therefore you could build on that success and have a positive outcome. So I think in terms of understanding Nixon and Kissinger, I mean, first of all, they that the the weight of that is 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 very significant. Um, and so they do actually think that that the combination of military setbacks, maybe not a victory, but setbacks in conjunction with diplomacy will work. I think that's how they begin. You know, the other thing that's very instructive in this is that um, when Kissinger comes in, he sends out a questionnaire, not just to the military, but to the State Department, the CIA, every, you know, any agency that's involved with Vietnam, and asks with a, a zillion questions, because he wants to know what everybody's thinking. And ironically, Daniel Ellsberg, um, who is a consultant on that project of putting together the questionnaire. And when they send that questionnaire out and then the answers come back, there is no sentiment whatsoever inside the US government back then to stop the war, um, right? Because this is now the government, I mean, this is now Melvin Laird hasn't taken over the Department of Defense. Um, although I actually think Laird was influenced to some significant degree by Clark Clifford, his predecessor, maybe even McNamara who these people had gotten much more burned and much more troubled, right? But in other words, when all those questionnaires come piling in, nobody's saying leave. So, I mean, one of my answers to my students is that they didn't really understand at the beginning 
how difficult the task was going to be and they're not listening to people who might tell them that so that's really important i mean in some profound way nixon and kissinger did not get where they were without being conformist i mean i know it's an odd thing to say but they're very deep conformist and the whole government's telling them you know that they can go on and so part of what happens is that they get trapped they, they get trapped because um, for those early months that they're in charge, there's something like what maybe 500 deaths a week. I mean, there are thousands of Americans killed in their first six months in office. So once that's happened, they don't really have an easy exit. The other thing I wanted to say about the contradiction that you're correctly pointing out is Kissinger understands that Laird's advice is trouble. He sees that after, right, that there, that his ability to get a favorable settlement is being undercut if you start taking out troops. He does understand that. And he fights against it. And he writes memorandums saying, don't listen to Melvin Laird. But in the end, the president is listening to Melvin Laird. He, Nick, Kissinger can fight along the way. No, don't take out 40,000, take 30,000. You know, there's a lot of that. But the other part is that, that it's Kissinger's interest to forget what he knew, which is if you're taking troops out, the chances of getting a good deal is really reduced every time you take more troops out. He knew that, but he's not, that's it. He, because understanding that being in power for him is the most important thing. Um, well, you, uh, uh, you'll know this, but I've, I've, I'd like to share it with, the, with our audience before we go to questions. Uh, Nick uh, Kissinger had a wonderful, meta, an interesting metaphor for explaining, uh, in his mind, the problem of withdrawing troops. He said it's like eating salted peanuts. Right. You're going to get addicted to it. You're going to want more of it, and of course, that's what happened. Um, but uh, but Richard Nixon, for reasons you explained very well, uh, found himself in a way trapped by Mel Laird and the movement. And by the movement and also by Congress, which we haven't yeah. spoken about, you know, and again, you know, early in our conversation, you, you know, we're asking about, you know, surprises. And I think to some extent, the congressional part of the story was a little bit of a surprise for me. Now, this again, maybe, you know, if you were in the anti-war movement back then, you're always mad at Congress. You know, you always think that Nixon's lying when he says he's taking 40,000 troops out. But when you look at the record, it's different. And while on the one hand, for the first four years, except um, with respect to Cambodia, the Congress never passes anything that is powerful enough to stop the war. So again, that's what we saw back then. But the flip of it is, is that the anti-war movement's pressure on Congress is having an effect that you can't see just by votes, but that members of Congress are very unhappy with what's going on. There's a lot of, you know, it isn't like how the Republicans are now, right? It's like, you can't tell the president, you know, people tell the president, you know, this isn't really good. We don't like this. And so there's a lot of informal pressure. And for Nixon, I, I, there's a phrase that he uses, um, which I, I, I was very surprised by. Nixon describes his situation as we're one step ahead of the sheriff. Uh, that was Nixon's you know, metaphor. Because what he believed is that his ability to hold Congress was contingent on taking those troops out. But that's, you know, that that's, that's where he, that if he was gonna stop, if he's gonna say, no, Melvin Laird, I'm not taking any troops, I'm tired of that you know, that he's going to have a major upheaval in Congress. Um, so that also is an important source of pressure. And there too, the, the work that people in the anti-war movement did to move Congress is important. And one of the things when Nixon uh, has this huge um, victory in November re of re-election, um, the thing that uh, most people didn't really notice was that more anti-war Congress people were elected in that election at the same time as the landslide. And there is this moment, you know, where I think maybe a week or two after Nixon has been reelected, 
where his hardcore supporters got Barry Goldwater, uh, John Stennis, Gerald Ford, they come up to the White House and they tell him, you know what, when the new Congress comes in, there's not going to be any money. We can't, this is, time is up. And so if, whatever Henry's doing in Paris, he needs to settle this up because we're not going to be able to get this through anymore. So, speaking you know, of, I think that's another important factor. Speaking of time, we've now had a few questions come in and I'd like to go through them with you. First question, uh, Rusty, can you talk about William Sullivan? his multiple roles in Vietnam, Paris, and his subsequent presence in Tehran and Manila. Who was he and what was his relationship to Kissinger and Nixon? You know, I, I actually am gonna beg off of that question because I feel like I would just say cliches. I don't feel like I have a good understanding of his role. I don't think he was very important in that first, sem in, in that first term. I think his importance comes in a little bit later. Um, so, so, but I don't think I have any wisdom to share on that point. Okay. Our second question is, why was the military brass so wrong in its assessment of Vietnam at the time Nixon and Kissinger came to power? It's a very good question. But I think part of the answer is that it's their job to be optimistic. You know, that, right? That there's a, there is a natural um, inclination right that that what is their project their project is war and so that the way that those generals are thinking about it is they're thinking about what's the next thing we can do that will enable us to have a more successful result and again they weren't totally crazy about that either right because the Tet offensive actually had been a setback for the enemy they weren't wrong to think it you know, but I think on the other hand, the, that they were thinking about these issues in terms of weapons and strategy and money. And part of the of, of what they weren't thinking about was the people of Vietnam, you know, of, of the nationalism of the people of Vietnam, you know, and and so so, you know, yes, if we say, you know, we have, you know, X number of soldiers here and they have Y number of soldiers there and we can then see that, you know, certain results will follow. Yeah, maybe. But you have to factor in the morale. And one of the things that's interesting, actually, is uh, as the time goes by, um, you know, if Creighton Abrams, who was, had replaced Westmoreland and who I think initially when he took over was, was, you know, optimistic that he had a strategy that would actually work. But as time goes by, you know, when you, when you read that their transcripts of their tapes of Creighton Abrams or, as well as Nixon, and um, when you see those transcripts, he becomes more and more puzzled by the resilience of the enemy. You know, that's not a thought in his mind in, you know, January of 69, but go back, you know, another year or two, and you, you see him asking, how are they doing this? Well, isn't that, I mean, isn't that part of the, the story here that the United States uh, had this old vision of the Cold War thinking that uh, regimes like uh, North Vietnam and Cuba uh, didn't have agency. They, they didn't actually have their own desires, their own ambitions, that they were somehow a puppet, you know, they were, they were puppets of Moscow and Beijing. And one of the things that's clear from the book and from a lot of the new Cold War history is, you know, Hanoi is doing what Hanoi wants to do. And, and I, I think that probably the U.S. military just didn't quite understand. No, they wasn't. I mean, plus you have to also factor. I mean, there's a lot of aspects of that situation that really have to do with bureaucracies and military bureaucracy, right? The pressure on people, you know, all up the line to to say that things were successful even when they weren't, right? It's like a lot of lying, right? That you don't you don't you don't get promoted because you just. Um, you know, sustained a, a defeat in the field of battle. You're going to always talk about what your success is. So there's a tremendous amount of misinformation that's coming up all the time to the to the top. So you know, again, if your orientation, you're not there to go to the United Nations. You're there to win a war. <laughs> 
And that's what you think the task is. And you've got all these people below you that think that's what the task is. The information is going to follow. But one of the most interesting, you know, reflections actually is Nixon. Um, and I can't remember, you know, offhand, like when this comes up, it's towards, you know, it's, it's in that maybe January of 73, that Nixon said, you know, said, why are those, why are their fighters so much better than ours? But ours not meaning our American soldiers, but meaning South Vietnam. How did that actually happen? And he says at one point in this moment of, of insight, he said, you know, we, maybe we should learn from this that we made the South Vietnamese too dependent on us. And the Russians, and I mean, he says this directly, right? And the Russians and the Chinese did not do that. No, they didn't. And, we're, and we are now seeing the effects of it. I wanna thank Michael for that question. I wanna to go to a question from Andy. You referred to the movement and the Mad Men. Can you say briefly, uh, Rusty, professor, your featured role in this PBS documentary that de debuted nationally last month? Well, I, they, the people who were um, doing that documentary, and again, it, it's available. People can, you know, can still watch it. Um, and it's it's an interesting documentary, the, the movement and the madmen. And it's it's really focused on this time period, right? You know, in the October November sixty nine period, that that's really where, you know, that's the narrative of the documentary. And what they did was they interviewed a lot of historians. Um, you know, about that period, you know, who had seen classified, you know, records on the one hand, then, but a lot of why the film is, I think, very powerful is something else that they're interested in, which is showing, you know, how broadly based the anti-war movement really was. And of course, the moratorium was done by, you know, moderate activists. But what's interesting is that, and actually maybe there are people listening who don't even know what we're talking about. So I just say, this was the idea that you would have one day on October 15th where people would stop what they were doing and do some anti-war initiative. You know, and it could be very modest. It could be almost, you know, except it had to be peaceful. So the idea was to facilitate a lot of people really participating in something. And that was incredibly successful and really a big problem for the White House, which was set to escalate. Um, so, and then the idea was you'd have two days in November that would happen and so forth. But part of what's powerful, I think about the film and worth seeing is just that you, you get a sense of the breadth of the anti-war movement, which I think has been really lost. You know, my students think, well, the anti-war people were, you know, like a bunch of weird hippies and that's who it was. So it's not true. So um, that's what it did. The, the, I would say that the guidance they got actually from historians, uh, really um, from especially Bill Burr at the National Security Archive, in terms of the planning that was going on around the projected escalation, um, so that was an important source. You know, I think that probably my relevance was more on the general point that the anti-war movement really did affect what happened. It's dramatic at that moment in November of, of 69, but it's present all the way through. And, you know, that there was more accomplishment than people thought. But I'm going to... Yes, go ahead. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump. Uh, the next question has to do with JFK and Vietnam. I'm going to jump over that since we're talking about Nixon in this. Sure it's a very good question, but uh, I'm, I want to end with this last question, uh, which is, again, related to Nixon in that period. Could you please talk about Nixon's relationship with the CIA, especially Colby and Helms? Did he take their advice or was he skeptical? No, he didn't like them. For the most part, you know, I mean, again, it could vary on particular issues where he would, you know, take them seriously in certain areas. I think he had the perception about the CIA, you know, with respect to Helms, um, you know, with respect to Vietnam, that they were very unreliable. That's that um, it's not that they were, ad I mean, again, they weren't really advocating peaceful solutions. So I don't want to go that far, but that he didn't see them as people whose insight was very, uh, very useful. He tended to think that the CIA, you know, it's a little bit, in his mind, it's it's like the CIA is an extension of the State Department, right? And all those people 
you know, that whole strata that this is the Ivy League, you know, that these are people who, um, you know, are, are kind of a feat, uh, overly intellectual, you know, that, that, that his stereotypes about the State Department kind of extended to the CIA, except, you know, obviously the CIA in general was not opposing U.S. policy in Vietnam. It really wasn't. And then certain things that the CIA was involved in, like the Phoenix program, which became, you know, in part an assassination program. I think that that he just wasn't very interested in in that one way or the other. I mean, it, it certainly didn't bother him. In your book, you show that the CIA is uh, the CIA analysts, as opposed to the operators, yeah. are 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 suggesting that Hanoi's um, determination is not going to be easy to break. Right. which is not something White House wants to hear. Right. No, I mean, that's really important, Tim, that you're bringing that out. I mean, that they, right, that they will be more of a source of, of negative information uh, that Nixon doesn't want to hear. Um, you know, the military never changes in this way. I mean, I don't, you know, just looking back at the record, I, I, I've read the whole Joint Chiefs of Staff history, which is several volumes. So you may have read some of that as well. And military never is never gets to a place where they they say that we're going to lose or we should retrench. They never they never make that argument. So, I I think actually one of the failures I think in my of my book, if I could say it, <laughs> that there are any failures, is is really understating the importance of the military in terms of the decisions that are made. Um, Rusty, um, I don't want to end with. The discussion of the failure of anything because <laughs> except the war um but because your book is very engaging it pulls together what's ho- happening at home with what what's happening in southeast asia and also in beijing and moscow it's a superb read it's a great achievement and i very energetically enthusiastically recommend those of us those who are listening to get out and get a copy and read it. Um, well, thank you, Tim. And you've done so much work making material available to scholars. I think that that's, you know, really a remarkable achievement as well. Uh, thank you. I had a great time, and I I loved. Uh, I want to thank you for 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 letting me do that because I obviously was working for all of you and for a few years. Good. The pleasure. Um, that will have to be um, our last comment. Thank you very much, Rusty. And our last question, my thanks to the Leon Levy Center and to Shelby White for her generous support. To all of you, thank you for your attention. Rusty, thank you for your scholarship and your passion. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.